<laughs> hey guys, welcome to another edition of Let's Talk Health. Sorry about the delay, technical difficulties. Google has defeated us tonight, or should I say the internet has defeated us tonight. It's really hard getting so many people on the same hangout all around the world with uh, lack of internet, this and that. So, to our best of ability, I've managed to get one person with a proper internet connection and everything seems okay. And that is Sean. Sean, how are you doing, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful, Amir. How are you doing tonight other than having technical difficulties? <laughs> uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm probably burning a lot of magnesium, and my vitamin D is probably dying out, but overall, I'm quite well. <laughs> you better have some little some old magnesium on hand from Dr. Ben. And that's Definitely right. Definitely help. That's right. So, you know, originally tonight, we were planning to have a discussion about vitamin D, the vitamin D expert panel. Well, obviously, you can see... We have two gentlemen missing, Jim Larson and Morley Robbins. Uh, we are going to postpone the vitamin D panel for a couple of weeks from now because we want to be fair for you. We want to give you the best that we got. So what's going to happen right now is we're going to have pretty much a free-for-all Q&A with Sean. We have some pre-selected questions. We're going to answer some questions on Facebook. So everybody out there on Facebook sent some questions away. Uh, and we're going to start off with some questions right now that we have for Sean. Sean, you ready? I'm ready. I'm here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, it's the first one's pretty much about vitamin D, but uh, I'm not. We'll see if we're familiar with this. Uh, we have a question from JD Yoga. She writes, "I know that vitamin D has many functions in the body. How does vitamin D stimulate the enzymes that generate dopamine?" Um, actually, the the vitamin D is definitely associated with dopamine. Um, receptors so it does you have to remember Amir people are under this impression that vitamin D is a vitamin that's not necessarily true vitamin D is actually a hormone it acts very similar like a hormone um, a lot of doctors call it a quasi hormone because it does not it does not just affect one receptor it affects multiple receptors and um, when you're dealing with vitamin D it does affect the dopamine receptors to what extent that I'm not sure of but I do know that when a person takes vitamin D, uh, it does make them feel better. So it may help to stimulate some of the dopamine in the brain and help to balance out the serotonin. So um, I'm not exactly sure exactly how that works, but just from anecdotal um, responses from people that I work with, that giving them vitamin D does make them feel better. Um, getting the right dosage is uh, highly recommended. You just got to be careful on taking on taking, not taking too much, but taking vitamin D in combination with the right uh, mixture of nutrients because vitamin D does not act alone. It acts in a synergistic form with several different nutrients. Yeah, you, you hit a, a key point over here and I know you specialize in adrenal fatigue, a lot of stuff with uh, cortisol issues. Can, can you shine some light on that? So what type of connection has vitamin D hormone or even like say other mineral deficiencies have to do with adrenal fatigue? Well, you, you definitely need magnesium and we lose magnesium at a higher rate because of the amount of stress we're under. Not only the amount of stress we're under, but also heavy metals. A lot of people that I deal with tend to have a lot of heavy metals and environmental toxins and they actually come up with normal vitamin D on their red blood cell. But because they have these metals and other toxins in their system, it actually blocks the vitamin D it actually blocks the vitamin D from doing its job at the receptor site. Because the heavy metals such as mercury and um, aluminum and a few others actually bind to the receptor sites so the magnesiums can't lock in. Mercury is noted for this. Mercury is probably one of the worst that actually uh, locks into the receptor sites. Um, for the nutrients and you can actually end up with a magnesium deficiency because of the heavy metal blockage uh, at the receptor site and that's what people have to understand when you're taking vitamins and stuff you have to understand just because you take a magnesium or a calcium the question is 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 it getting into the intracellular compartment um, doing its job at the cellular level because there's so many factors in each case they have to look at that potentially block these block the vitamins from doing their job and this is why a lot of people slip through the cracks um, because like in adrenal fatigue I see a lot of people that are magnesium wasters in a urinary test and they're excreting high levels of magnesium and instead of instead of taking they normally take a lot of magnesium like 
400 to 800 milligrams. But mm. you've got to address the underlying issues, which is the adrenals. Because the adrenals, it, it comes back to the old philosophy, you know, are you going to are you going to fill the holes in the bucket? It's like pouring water into a bucket of holes. You're going to keep constantly pouring the water in. You're going to constantly keep dripping, constantly leaking out. Well, you have to plug the holes in order to keep the magnesium from leaking out of the cells. So yeah. um, that's a major, with the adrenals, I've had a lot of people that had magnesium deficiencies um, from not the amount of magnesium they're taking, but the amount they're wasting out. And that's usually due to adrenal issues, aldosterone's involved there, and also thyroid. Um, the thyroid controls a lot of intracellular nutrients, and magnesium's one of them. Yeah, but you hit a you hit a key point. You were mentioning heavy metals such as mercury and aluminum, but how are we originally even accumulating these heavy metals? Like I know we're exposed to them every day, but in your own definition, what's actually causing us to retain the heavy metals in our body? Well. The process called methylization is definitely one of the major components that's allowing this to happen because if a person is not methylating right or chelating the minerals out naturally, they're going to store up in their systems. You may have a gene called APOE, which um, if a person is going to get mercury or has a heavy load of mercury, then they're going to be more likely to store that metal longer than the average person. I just had a recent case of this where the mother or where the daughter had it the father had it, and when I looked at his genes and stuff, I said, "You're definitely, in, you know, you're definitely going to have high levels of mercury." He goes, "You're absolutely right." And when you look at the pathology of the issue, he was a dentist. So not only did he have high levels, his daughter also had like high levels, and not only in mercury and copper, mm. um, because of the copper piping that was in the house. But she has a genetic predisposition to store heavy metals, which are mainly copper and mercury. Uh, that's interesting. And would you say that's also correlated to uh, dysbiosis or biofilm accumulation? Yeah, the biofilm, um, I mean, organism creates biofilm, but you have to understand that you, you need biofilm in order for, the, the biofilm is, the, is a natural mechanism for all bacteria, because biofilms aren't really bad. Your body's supposed to have biofilms, okay? Underneath the biofilm is a world of communication through uh, colonization of um, pathogenic bacteria as well as benign bacteria. So there's, there's theories about the biofilm, but it really hasn't been proven. And my theory, my question is this. The biofilm has been in place ever since the existence of man, mm. okay? And if we start messing with that or altering it in any way, we don't know the repercussions of that. Yes, you may be opening it to pathogenic bacteria to get at them. But the question is, is what are you doing to the beneficial bacteria? Are you potentially exposing the bacteria which has been encased in biofilms for cent you know, for as long as we were in existence, exposing mm -hmm. it to an outside source? How's the body gonna respond to that? Nobody knows. And that's why I think biofilms, if they're specifically targeted, um, the approach for biofilms, if they're specifically targeted, are fine. But if you're just going to blast biofilms and try to remove them, I'm very cautious about that because you don't know what the natural evolutionary response is to that. Because you're messing with Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. and it's, something, it's something that a lot of people don't think about. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you're disturbing something that has been untampered for a long time, what are the repercussions? Could your body actually start to have autoimmune uh, autoimmune issues against your own natural bacteria? We don't know. It's yeah. too new to understand this. Now, would this have any connection or would you be familiar with LPS? Any connection with this? Um, the intestinal permeability? Uh, lipopolysaccharides? Uh, I've ran across them in my um, Ventures. I'm not too adept on that, but if I research the information, it would definitely refresh my mind. But I have ran across them, most definitely. I'm just now, too familiar with them right now. We have a question over here, and it's actually a pretty good question. And you always hear people talking about 
taking your trace minerals or taking your electrolytes, but if you do have certain dysbiosis, if you do have gut permeability, what are the chances that you're actually absorbing the electrolytes or the trace minerals? Um, the potential is actually pretty good because there are small enough molecules that they'll be able to get through to the GI tract um, because there's a debate about trace minerals because being in the um, chelated form versus the ionic form, um, the debate's still out there. There's really no scientific research to say one way or another. Um, I talked to one of the doctors from um, um, Spectrocell on this, and I said, what's the difference between chelated and ionized? And he said the only research out there is, is on chelated minerals like Albion's uh, track. Um, he said they're the ones that are only highly researched. If there's other information out there, uh, I'd be glad to like to see the research on that, to see about the absorption. Um, because when you take trace minerals, um, a lot of it's mainly magnesium. Uh, I take trace minerals myself. It's one of the it's one of the um, it's one of the go-to things I use for constipation. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you trace if you take trace minerals and you're constipated, and this doesn't break it, then there's something definitely that you need to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's another key thing you just hit about. People need to also realize that you can't just be taking, for example, you say I need magnesium or, or I need vitamin D or I need, uh, I don't know, whatever mineral you want, sodium, potassium. You can't just blindly be taking any form. You have to know what form you're taking, for what reason you're taking, and timing matters, right? Exactly. Not only the timing, but also separating from other minerals as well. For example, you take you can't take calcium with iron, uh, magnesium, or zinc because they all bind. I mean, literally, you will drive. Uh, literally, somebody will drive themselves insane trying to look at the mineral wheel and trying to correspond that what you should not and should not take together. Um, the best thing to do there is 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 to get the Albion form, which is the chelated form, which is the most I feel the most absorbable, and they don't tend to have this problem with absorption. Um, the two minerals that I definitely would recommend separating are zinc and copper mm. because zinc um, will bind to copper, but copper will not bind uh, as much to zinc. Zinc is actually more prevalent to reduce copper than vice versa. Cool. We have a question in from Tracy. She says, are there ideal times to take lecithin, L-theanine, and GABA? GABA is mostly... T go GABA, actually, phenylbute is actually better than GABA because it actually causes the blood-brain barrier. GABA doesn't really raise GABA levels, but phenylbute actually does. And mm. we've seen the difference of using um, GABA with phenylbute. Uh, we have actually, what do you mean by phenylbut phenylbutyrate? No, phenylbut is um, phenylbut is a form of GABA that's actually found in cabinase, uh, which is a product by Neuroscience that I use a lot in people at COMT. Mm -hmm. This is my go. This is my go-to when I have people with COMT, or this is my go-to when I have people that are on Xanax or Ativan, and I try to help lean them off with the help of the psychiatrist um, overseeing them because you don't ever want to come off any kind of meds without medical supervision especially uh, antipsychotic drugs um, because the repercussions are very dangerous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you hit another good chord you're talking about Compton and the GABA what's your take on the whole idea that people just because we talked about this before, and I'm just going to keep on reiterating it nonstop because I really want to get the message out there. That, and I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of clients always ask me the same question. I know you also, Sean, have the same uh, issues I had. It's just because they think they have, say, a homozygous variation of COMPT doesn't mean necessarily that they're affected by it. That's very true. That's why you have to look at the underlying pathology. You have to look at some kind of evaluation test, uh, whether it be a nutri eval or a neuroscience test. You want to have some kind of evidence supporting that they have an active COMT. Mm -hmm. um, you can see this within neuroscience, or you'll see that the you know the dopamine or the epinephrine's really high in the urinary patterns. Um, you'll see um, a person with anxiety disorders. Uh, person in estrogen dominance. So mm -hmm. you have to look at current 
underlying um, issues based upon their history and their current symptoms in order to validate if that's active or not. And what do you do yourself? Like, what are you looking for the CBS is like, what kind of tests are you looking? What other biomarkers are you looking to validate that maybe COMT is a culprit within your health? Um, when you're looking at COMT, I'll look at the um, estrogen, either estrogen dominance through just simple blood test, saliva test, or a urine test. I'll see if they're active that way. I'll see if on a CMT, I'll look for GABA to see okay. if their GABA levels are low on a neuroscience test. Um, I'd also look to see um, about the estrogen metabolites. Are they elevated? Um, there's a couple different. I'd look also look for magnesium deficiency yeah. because magnesium actually inhibits um, COMT. Actually, because, talking about talking about magnesium, the one and the only magnesium man's here. Morley, oh, well, he left. He just left. <laughs> He'll be back. Anyways, going back to the magnesium. So magnesium is uh, uh, a deficiency is a culprit of COMT. Absolutely. Um, if you have it inhibited, it may be downregulated by 35%, but if you give magnesium, it may actually, you know, give some support for it. That's why one of the, one of the reasons I give magnesium glycinate, it's a two-fold situation. Because number one, it's a very biological form of magnesium, and number two, you've got the glycinate going in there, which acts on the GABA receptor as a very common. Um, when people are revved up and stuff, I don't tell them I make recommendations don't use the magnesium spirates. Um, magnesium citrate I have found to be one of the least bioavailable forms. Um, it may help with some symptoms that they may have, but it's not replenishing the cellular compartment. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for intracellular um, changes through mechanisms. I'll, like I measure um, vitamin D125 and vitamin D levels. Um, Morley and I just had a really interesting conversation and not going to be, you know, beat vitamin D to death, but we feel that actually vitamin rays of vitamin D125 is actually a negative feedback loop mm. for a magnesium deficiency, which is resulting in low magnesium levels. Mm -hmm. um, I actually just started collecting data on um, people in relationship to vitamin D deficiencies, 25 OH, in relation to vitamin D125 in relationship to red blood cell magnesium. So this is going to be an interesting um, Mr. Morley, can you hear us? I think we have a special guest joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Just Google Hangouts giving us a little technical difficulties at the moment. No worries. This is the beauty of I wouldn't say live radio, but I call this live TV. Sean, you're back. I'm back. Uh, Morley tried to join us again, but unfortunately, uh, he had technical issues. Mm. But as I was saying, collecting this data is crucial because it may be able to set up some kind of research study to actually prove that vitamin D or D deficiency is actually a magnesium deficiency. Wow, that's that's really interesting yeah. because. Uh, <laughs> I'm not against vitamin D supplementation. I believe there's a time and place for all forms of supplementation, but going in blindly and just supplementing for the sheer fact that somebody told you to supplement is a it's it's a foolish act. Yes, it is, and that's why you need to be under a skilled practitioner in order to um, just follow the recommendations, because. Amir, we're not doctors, okay? What our job is is we're trying to help educate and change the health care system to a more preventative style or more educating what we call a functional medicine or an integrative health approach because um, that's what our overall goal is. Is My goal is is help the doctors. Um, I am taking on I – I do see clients, but my main focus is, is how, much, how much more help can I be given – people out there other than going to the source and educating the doctors themselves. So that's what my overall um, objective is, um, and to educate the masses. Actually, what, what, how was your reaction so far been with uh, working with uh, your local doctors or local GPs? Have you had good relationships, or has it been kind of like 
kind of brick in the wall? Like, what type of reactions have you been getting? When you're dealing with clients, um, when you're dealing with clients, I always ask them, "Do you have a doctor on board?" Because I will not normally take if it's a very complex case. I will not take it without a, uh, a medical doctor on board. Yeah. Because I have to make recommendations to get the proper testing done. Yeah. And if you don't have that information, then you're flying in the dark. Yeah. And that's one of my um, niches is that I'm able to get the information by having the client work with their doctor and f and feel them out to see are they open minded? Are they willing to learn? Um, are they willing to take a step forward in the direction that you know medicine is actually going? And normally I get a very positive response. I'd say greater than seventy percent. Mm. You know, and if they don't have somebody, there's always Plan B because I've developed a huge network of doctors that I work with. So there may be somebody in their area that they may not know that's there. To where I say, hey, you know, you're in Texas. Guess what? I have a doctor that's only thirty minutes away. That's specialized. That's open-minded. Who I worked with before in the past, and be glad to bring you on. Um, and then that way they can use their insurance to get the information, get the block, proper blood testing done. And one of my approaches, Amir, is, is it's always cost effective because people have been sick for a very long time. And I know from my own personal experience that I've spent a few hundred thousand dollars or close to it on my own health issues. And from my own experience, I've learned to n reduce the, the need for testing or target specific testing to where you can get your information probably within about four or five weeks to be able to nail it down to mm. okay we have this test this test this test we don't need to do the X Y and Z and in that way once you have the clinical data you know like since we're not doctors we can't make diagnosis but we can make recommendations and we can educate um, that is not against the law um, because in medicine we have to be very careful because there's practicing medicine out of medicine without a license and that's subject to criminal prosecution and so we have to be very very careful in the way we present information to clients as well as doctors we have to do it from an educational standpoint because it's the final it's the doctor who has the final say on the proper treatment that may be recommended I couldn't agree with me more definitely uh, we have a question in and it's coming from uh JD Yoga and she's writing in does vitamin D stimulate enzymes that generate dopamine obviously we already talked about this but to continue is it true that if you do have a VDR TAC defect you are susceptible to lower vitamin D levels and you make less dopamine that's a very good question I, I believe the first I believe the answer on the first part is yes you do tend to need a little bit more vitamin D than the average person on the other end, on the dopamine, that I'm not too familiar with, so I'm not going to comment on that because I don't want to get misinformation. But I'm sure if I went out and researched it on Google, I could probably be able to find it within about 30 seconds. Yeah. Well, that brings me to another like point of view. Is I I have a lot of people talking about. Once again, we're going to start talking about MTHFR. They're saying they're homozygous, heterozygous. They have this and that. I'm just trying to really tell people out there that, listen, just because, and I'm going to keep on saying this, I'm going to be like a broken record over and over and over again, just because, ladies and gentlemen, you have an MTHFR or you have the VDR does not necessarily mean it's affecting you, right? Amir, it's not about the gene, it's about the expression. That's right. That is the whole um Ever since that one little case that I had, it really awoke me to see a, how a person could have a homozygous um, CBS pathway on two CBS pathways, homozygous, A360 and C9, the, uh, the, um, the um, it's A360 and then it's the uh, C99. C99, yeah. And it was to the point, and this is where I came to the conclusion, is, is older generations are not exposed to, their genes are different than ours. Mm. 
Yeah. So if a person's over the age of 65, I will be extremely cautious on making any kind of recommendations that may inhibit the proper function of the CBS pathway because I found out that sulfur is actually needed for uh, respiration mm. and it's also needed for blood pressure um, because following following the typical sulfurization protocol you know or recommendations um, her blood pressure shot through the roof mm. really fast and luckily it wasn't too severe and it was caught in time and then her, she noticed that her breathing was she was getting um, shortness of breath but she was following just the same protocol as I would if I put somebody 30 years on it so in that situation you need to look at the history and you need to look at the lifestyle well you're right this brings back what Dr. Ben Lynch was talking about also Dr. Tim Jack, Dr. Jess, uh, Dr. Jack Cruz it comes back to the whole fact that you have to become a true detective you have to look at signs and symptoms you can't just you can't just see a test results and base base your protocol you know protocols on test results you have to base it on the given situation at hand like what's happening in your client's life what's happening emotionally what's happening spiritually what's happening environmentally all mm -hmm. these are necessary cofactors to find the root cause of the issues finding the root cause is not a science it's an art form yeah because once you get all the data you have to compile all that data together like I just got a case yesterday I've got to go through close to 150 pages of information hmm. okay then I gotta separate that all apart then I gotta look how each of those imbalances are connected with each other I mean you're looking about anywhere between six or seven hours of research just before I even start on the case yeah so these are the, the more the complex the case the more you have to break things down and once you get the proper testing you know people send me mounds of labs I said listen here's the testing that I recommend and here's the reasons why I recommend it and he, this is why I'm making recommendations because it's going to save you a, it's going to save you a lot of time in the long run because you're getting to the root cause by getting an overall picture yeah that's why I recommend either neutral eval or the ion test for metametrics as a start starting block and then it all depends on the person's financial state you have to work with that person's financial state because they've already you know by the time they get to you and I they've already been through the gamut and they've already been exhausted of funds yeah. you know and that's making our job much difficult so we have to be prepared for that and we do offer services at a very respectable cost okay because most of the people have gone to the five thousand dollar people or they've spent fifteen thousand dollars on this protocol treatment and they're still not better you know so you have to offer them a good product but you also have to be able to adjust that product based upon um, their financial needs yeah I totally agree. Uh, we have a question, in, and the question has to relate to methyl trapping. Can you please explain to me uh, what what does methyl trapping mean? For example, if you're taking one methyl B12, do you need to take it with folate? Can you please expand on that? Thank you. Um, when you're dealing with methyl trapping, what happens is, is number one, is, is it's usually the folic acid that gets trapped. Um, many people that have elevated folic acid serums in their blood um, are not converting to the proper form. So adding methyl B12 in that situation without knowing the SNPs would be the proper thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, And then you would add it very slowly. But again, you're only addressing one of the issues, which is most likely that person's probably got MTHFR. Okay, mm -hmm. And if you're addressing it, some doctors may give um, hydroxycobalamin for it. Um, one of the traditional combinations we were using was um, PERC, um, which was hydroxy B12 with methyl B12 at low dosages. That was the Dr. Rich's protocol. Yeah. Which, you know, at that time was wonderful. Now we're discovering that by giving hydroxy, if you have any kind of other enzymes or down regulated, you're not converting that into um, methyl B12 or you're not converting that into uh, adenosine cobalamin. Okay. And we're finding out that people with pathogens 
are at high risk of downregulation of that enzyme. Um, there's currently a lot of research going into vitamin B12 metabolism, you know, what enzymes are involved, what things are downregulating it, and how do we get around it. So as of now, um, a person may take adenosine and they may have the enzyme that converts adenosine into methyl B12 or methyl B12 into adenosine. Yeah. We don't know that. But hopefully in the very, very near future, we're going to have a test that will actually break down the, the B12s into mm. their biological forms like um, they do with folate um, from um, Health Diagnostics, I believe it is. Yeah. It has a test that breaks down the whole step of the um, folate metabolism. We're hoping to do that soon for B12, which will be a great asset. Because that way you'll know what you know what enzymes will be downregulated. You'll know what to um, you'll know what to supplement with, and you'll know by taking too much. Because we found out that we thought adenosine um, actually was straight into the mitochondria, but because when Sterling was taking it, she found out that when she was taking it, it actually converted into methyl B12, and it stood because she has such a bad CRMT. It was actually causing the COMT to to um, be affected mm. um, because of the VDR being negative, so she couldn't handle methyl groups, and that's how we found out just by an accident that a, a dibenzoside or a denison does not just go into mitochondria, um, but people with like Lyme, people with like fibromyalgia, or any kind of like MS may want to think about not using hydroxy because your enzymes are probably down regulated so that's mm. not working properly so we're probably switching people over to adenosine cobalamine right now and reducing the hydroxy for the fact of probably majority of people's enzymes are down regulated they just have we just they just don't know about it mm. uh, and when you add B12 in, what that does is it converts the folic acid into the 5-methyl form. And then it actually unlocks the methyl trapping. Um, you want to get things going. You want to get the cycle going slow, but you don't want to speed it up too fast. And it's all about conversions and what enzymes are down-regulated or up-regulated. And that's the trick of the genetic testing is to look into that. Yeah, definitely. And we have another question. Maybe it can actually tie into the the B12 and the intrinsic factor over here. Is what role does H. pylori have to play with B12? Obviously, it's a gigantic role. So, if you can please expand on that, Sean. It's a huge role. First of all, when you have H. pylori, you're you're going to downregulate your uh, pancreatic enzymes, mainly your hydrochloric acid, which is not going to be able to break down the B12 from the um, food you're taking in or maybe even supplements. Because um, a lot of the supplements we take are in cyanobolin in form, which a m majority of Americans take, and half of them don't have an intrinsic factor working. Um, and then you've got to worry about the, um, on H. pylori. H. pylori has a major impact on the sulfurization pathway yeah. um, because it pr produces sulf sulfide and you know, if you have a CBS pathway and a H. pylori pathway, uh, it's a very nasty combination. So, um, definitely taking care of getting rid of the pathogen is a must. But when you have H. pylori, there's always going to be downregulated hydrochloric acid. So that's going to be a major component. Now, um, what's what's your take on basics? Say, say people right now who don't have any testings or they, they just suspect that they have H. pylori. Is there any measures or baby steps that people can take to help them out? Um, when you're dealing with H. pylori, um, first thing you want to do is mastic gum. Works very well. You may want to do zinc carnosine, uh, which helps to heal the intestinal wall. Because um, a lot of times H. pylori, you're going to have... Um, gastrointestinal inflammation. Yeah. So you want to control the inflammation as best as possible. So you definitely want to go on a gluten-free, casein-free diet to help the GI mucosa. Um, you can use botanicals to help with the H. pylori. Um, olive leaf extract is good. Uh, Biosidrin is good. 
Um, there is, um, you know, off-brand for MMS, a Miracle Mineral Solution, but you just have to know what you're doing with that. But I use that a lot of times in people that have broad spectrum issues. Um, colloidal silver may help. Um, those are some of the few things that you can do. Yeah, I would even add in the like uh, bismuth uh, citrate bismuth, would work too. Bismuth and citrate. Yeah, um, and like you said, bi biocidin is very well. Uh, even baking soda, baking soda, the bicarbonate is very good at alkalizing the pH of the stomach and actually tricks the H pylori to come out of the stomach cell lining because it's spiral shaped and it's a tricky son of a gun that hides. Mm -hmm. So even if we're even if you're giving botanicals and you're giving the zinc, it's hard to actually administer it to the H. pylori since it hides. It's a very smart sucker. So we have to do some necessary steps to trick that little guy to come out of its hiding. That's very good information. I'm, a, I'm even learning stuff. <laughs> We're learning stuff every day, my friend. Oh, but yeah, I know. Uh, H. pylori is very, it's very unique. It's, 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 it's case dependent that people need to realize. and. Uh, also, you need to, if you do have signs and symptoms of H. pylori that you think you have some issues with, say, even IBS or some type of gastral situations, this is a perfect situation where warranting a stool test, like a really good uh, DNA stool analysis from Metametrics would give you such fantastic information to work with. Now, Sean, I'm pretty sure you have pretty good uh, pretty good history of working with that stool test, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and with the, um, w when you're dealing with H. pylori, anybody that's suspected to have uh, acid reflux, yeah. Oh, yeah. they should definitely get checked out. You would not believe how many, what I usually do in H. pylori is this. I'll usually test the amino acid sequences mm. to check, to make sure how the, how the body is metabolizing certain amino acids. And what happens from there is, is if I look at the, um, if I look at the levels, and majority of them are below the one third percentile, or if the glutamine is really low, then I'll know that there's an inflammatory response going on into the bowel, and that's going to usually lead me to uh, either leaky gut or some kind of uh, intestinal permeability issues or pathogen. So again, using simple tests which you can get through LabCorp or Quest. It's the evaluation of these tests which are crucial, and it's and it's all and you just got to use your insurance to the maximum capacity because um, it's amino acid sequence I use to run off the bat, and what I'll do is is I'll look at the uh, I usually use LabCorp because it gives a more definitive range because um, Quest is more like less than um, yeah. you can I mean if you do an amino acid profile on a person and you know what to look for. You can pick out MTHFR right off the bat because you'll see yeah. the homocysteine level is going to actually be undetectable or really, really low. And that usually means their methylization problem, even though the homocysteine level in the blood may be perfect at 6.5. That's yeah. why you have to look at the urinary output um, to see how it's getting there. Um, yeah. So you Well, can, even looking at, like we were mentioning, even like a very affordable test, a hair trace mineral analysis, looking at copper and heavy metals, it's a really good indicator of uh, methylation cofactors. Oh, yeah, especially on, the, especially on the hair analysis. You'll see low, most people that have CBS pathways have low malignum. Um, and you'll see low malignum and high copper, or people that have methylization problems, you'll see low cobalt and low lithium. Yeah. And usually with a great percentage that we have low lithium, you're going to have low cobalt because lithium actually drives cobalt into the cell. And that's why people that take B12, sometimes you have to take lithium along with it. Uh, small trace minerals, of course, not therapeutic drug doses in order to, to get cross over the blood brain barrier to get into the tissue. Um, I've, I've used... I've used uh, high dosages in a long a while ago. I used high doses of B12. They used to recommend for injections. Guess what? When you add a little bit of lithium to the mix, you can actually reduce those by a significant amount. But lithium is very tricky because um, people respond to it totally differently. That's why another good reason is to use trace minerals. Trace minerals has actually 2.5 milligrams of lithium already in it on a half serving. And when I don't take my trace minerals, I will feel the difference because it keeps the 
e electric system balanced so that you're not going to throw short, okay? Because even though they are trace, they're a major part of controlling your polarity in your body and your electrical system. Uh, and people tend to overlook that. Um, one of the things you've got to do is, is you got to, you know, balance out the cell membrane. Second thing you got to do is you got to control, you got to control the circuitry in the system, which is your potassium, you know, your electrolytes, and then you work on up. Too many doctors are working, and other practitioners are working downstream. They got to start at the lowest level because if those other factors aren't check, you know, your your um, your pressure gradient and stuff, it's not going to be working. If you're if you have the wrong gradient flow at the cell level, you're not going to be able to have you're not going to be able to get your nutrients into the cell. And if you have in, if you have impermeability, cellular impermeability. Well, you you just hit something key. I think we should expand a little bit on this. Uh, I was actually reading about this stuff not too long ago. Maybe a study that you sent me, but dealing with the whole issue of phosphatidylcholine and the phospholipid bilayers. The, the sheer importance of having proper delivery of the phospholipids for proper cellular communication. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, people that have a lot of issues dealing with mental issues, uh, especially anxiety, choline is crucial because it helps stabilize the cell membrane. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do this, it's got to be done very specific because I was talking to one client the other day and I asked him, so what kind of foods do you crave? She goes, man, he's like, I'm craving meat for some apparent reason. I said, I know why, because there's a nutrient in there that you need. And we went through all the nutrients and stuff. And she goes, that's why I feel better. I said, she <laughs> goes, is it that simple? I said, it probably is. I said, you always have to listen to what your body's craving and, and, and break it down biochemically to see what nutrients are in there. Because yeah. we went through B for like coenzyme Q10, alpha-lipoic acid, L-carnitine, you know, then we got to the fat system. It's like certain saturated fats, other components of the cell membrane are there. And I said, I'm the same way because I had, I had testing done to prove this, that, you know, because of the, and because of the environment, environmental influences, dysbiosis, uh, heavy metals, uh, viruses, other pathogens, just because, you know, people tell you to take fish oils, you may be doing yourself harm. So you need to have a proper evaluation done because what the general populace is telling you may be completely backwards um, because they don't understand. They're only going with the normal flow that fish oils are good. Well, fish oils are good in certain situations, but you come to the point to where you tip the scale the other way yeah. to where the fish oils actually become pro-inflammatory. Now, what, 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 what test or what, what sequencing would you do to actually – Significantly uh, mark out that you have uh, phospholipid dys dysfunction. Um, you can see it in the um, Nutri Eval. You can see it on a simple um, amino acid urine test from LabCorp or Quest. There are certain and there are certain metabolites that are given off that indi indicate what's going on. Um, I mean, when you see low phosphatidylserine, low. Um, They're, they're long chemical names. I would they, me would they measure choline levels or lecithin levels or anything like that? Or Well, they're, they're the end products of choline levels and what they convert into as mm. well as constituents of the cell membrane themselves. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm after going through my health issue, my main focus is on cell membranes. I mean, there's a saying that we have. We can't, we're only healthy as our cell membranes are, which is true. Because if you have ultra cell membrane permeability and instability, the nutrients that are supposed to be coming in are coming in, and the toxins are just going to be left to come right on in because you're losing that ability to select what comes in and what goes out. So you actually become intoxicated. That's why when I'm looking at these multiple chemical sensitivities and these people that have Lyme and all these other um, complex cases, that... I'm not even going towards where other doctors are going. I'm going into a whole nother level. And once I take care of that level and get those nutrients and get that proper balance, people's health are turning around real fast because you're addressing 300 trillion cell membranes. Yeah. And it's just not just one cell. It's permeated throughout the entire body, especially the brain.
Yeah, definitely. And, and talking about the downstream issues and talking about cellular membranes, right now I, I see a kind of an explosion. Now I'm a I'm a I'm a proponent of bioidentical hormones. I believe there's a time and place mm -hmm. where it's very there's valid uses for it, but I also believe that it's being abused as well. And it's a very dangerous thing to play around with. Now, can you shine some light on the fact that there is some situations where it's really, really beneficial, but there's some situations like, hey, Charlie, that's not for you. Well, there's a lot of doctors out there that are becoming hormone mills, as I call them. I mean, yeah. they're revolving doors. They'll go, a, a person who's 25 years old, they'll go in for testosterone level 200. They'll walk out with tes, uh, 200 milligrams of testosterone sipping once a week with 500 IUs of HCG two times a week. And then uh, like half a milligram of Arimedex three times a week. And out the door they'll go. They may feel good. These are the type of cases I deal with. They may feel good for two or three months and all of a sudden they feel like crap. Yeah. Okay. Number one is, is that person's 24 years old. All right. Let's look at sleep. Let's look at adrenal issues. Let's look at thyroid. Let's look at nutritional deficiencies. Why is his testosterone level low in the first place? Did he happen to fall on his head with his kid um, for brain trauma? That's why you you know ask the doctor, say, has this person had an MRI done uh, with or without contrast? You want to look for structural imbalances. Did he get kicked in the balls when he playing hockey or something? You know, that could be damaging. Yep. So you always want to look at the underlying causes. It's to see people that are coming into me that are 25 years old that are starting to kick themselves in the backside because they started hormone replacement therapy at 20, age 21. Now they still have their symptoms. They still they may improve in some areas, but you know their fatigue and mental issues are not being addressed. So in those situations, you have to look at the underlying cause. The first thing you look at is lifestyles. Let's let's face it. A 19 to 25 year old, they're going to be partying. They're going to be out <laughs> drinking. Yeah. You know, they're going to be working out like crazy. Now, 10 or 15 years ago, that could be no problem because their genetics were different. Yeah. You know, when I did that type of stuff, I wasn't a heavy drinker, but I was a workout freak, and I still am. A, I like. I do like to work out, but we were also involved in a lot of clubs. So we would go out to the clubs, and we'd be inhaling smoke because I was a bouncer. So I'd be inhaling smoke from Thursday all the way through Sunday nights. So it's probably one of the reasons what was a contributing factor to my decline in my own health was, mm. you know, improper environment, a toxic environment. Yeah. Okay, secondhand smoke. Now you got people that are um, dealing with issues that are that they don't have that, okay? But they do have electromagnetic fields. They do have internet access. They do have electronic fields coming from the internet. They have uh, wireless modems. They have satellites that are coming through. I mean, we're being bombarded by electromagnetic fields all over the place. And this is still stress itself. People, doesn't un people don't understand that, okay? There was a case I worked over in France that a person had completely had anemia, okay, mm -hmm. to a point. But the problem was is because they were under, I asked them, what are you near? And I said, is there any kind of electrical, are you around a power plant? He goes, I have high tension wires over top of my house. Well, what we found out was is that the electromagnetic fields was causing disruptions in the iron's ability, iron's ability to bind with the heme in order to create optimal oxygen. Yeah. And I said, do me a favor, leave the house for a little while, see how you feel. He felt fine. Yeah. So it was an environmental toxin. Yeah. Um, but his red blood cells, his ferritin levels were perfectly fine. There was no disrupt, there was no distortion at all in the um, normal blood chemistry. But once we moved him out of the house, um, and it wasn't mold because they had to check for mold. So it was actually electromagnetic disturbance. Yeah. And I had another case of the same one in Australia. The family had a whole history of psychological disorders. And I knew it was kind of, I knew it was geographic. Well, guess what? They had a power, they had an electrical power plant down the street. <laughs> and they lived there all their lives. So when ascertaining this information, you need to look at all variables. Lifestyle nutrition is first off the bat. Because otherwise everything else is a lost cause. And here's my thing about hormone replacement therapy. If the person has a piss poor lifestyles or poor nutrition, you were only given that 
person permission to continue that lifestyle. Yeah. And you're saying it's fine. I mean, that's like a diabetic going to a doctor saying, wow, I, he's like, my blood sugar level's high. You know what? You are on 10 milligrams of glipside. Let's increase it to 20. Rather than setting, say, hey, what did you eat the night before? Or let's correct, you know, let's look at your diet and just say, how about we cut down on some sugar and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you've got to look at the core source of what's going on and isolate it. I mean, I've had people that had um, one guy that was on hormone replacement therapy, uh, 29, and he was on he was on testim, and his testosterone levels were still 300. Okay, and when I went into his GI tract and started looking, running food allergy testing, I found out that he was allergic to like milk and um, and his ferritin levels were really really low. I'm like, what are you eating during the daytime? He goes. I'm eating red meat like two, three times a day. I'm like, how are you eating red meat and your ferritin levels are low? Well, he was taking whey proteins. He was taking so much whey protein that contains calcium that actually uh. binds with the iron. So he was actually causing iron deficiency because of the amount of calcium that he was taking in. Because he was doing probably close to um, 200, he was probably close to doing 13 or 1400 milligrams of calcium. And then he didn't have magnesium to balance out. Then he was eating all this red meat. And I'm like, why are your ferritin levels so low? Well, guess what? We removed, we found out that he was allergic to dairy in the first place. Yeah. He also had gluten sensitivity. So we removed the dairy, removed the wheat, and we were actually able to get his testosterone levels. We checked his red blood cell zinc completely below optimal level. So we started replacing his zinc levels, and guess what happened? Tapered him off the testosterone. His testosterone is now sitting around 550, 600. And he was a young guy, yeah. you know? There was no clomid to be. No, there was no clomid to be. Um, there was no clomid to be started, but he just started right up on his own. So you have to look at root cause. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, that's a great way to end the show tonight on a high note. It's always looking at the root cause, looking at the domino effect. So mm -hmm. I always talk about. You know, say the twenty fifth domino is type two diabetes, or say the twenty fifth domino is IBS. Well, not necessarily do I care for the twenty fifth domino. I care for the first domino. What initiated? What was the catalyst that started all that? And that's the whole point about this having this eagle bird's eye view, this thirty thousand foot view that you want to have is finding that whole picture, finding out you know cellular membranes, what's going on, finding out what's causing that issue. Because once we put out the fire, that initial first domino inflammation, the rest of that issues or signs and symptoms that you're going to have, they're gone. They're out the window. You know, Sean, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Where can people catch you? How can they get contact you? What's your website? Um, they can contact me at Sean, S-H-A-W-N, at MatrixHealthWell.com. That's my direct email address. Uh, my website is um, MatrixHealthWell.com. Um, you can contact me there. I'm still revamping that website, so... Um, it still needs. It's still in its earlier stages. Um, it's all. It's all good. Okay, uh, it's late. all good. <laughs> you hear it, folks. It's going to be in the show notes. Sean's information is going to be there. Reach him out. He's a one of a kind specialist. He boatload of information. I hope everybody has a good night. Until next week. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>